Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. I was at the um, women's conference yesterday, and um, I got home after. I not home. I was. I went to the hotel afterwards, and um, just as I walked into the lobby, it just hit me. Um, usually, just walking into airports or hotels just gets me that, wow, this has become, this has become my life, you know, and. My husband's not here, he's in prison, and um, you know, suffering and being tortured for his Christian faith in an Iranian prison, and my kids are, um, you know, it's been a hard and lonely road in some ways. They haven't been able to see him as much. I've been traveling all over the world and, uh, you know, trying to do what I can to you know, bring Said home and, and actually, uh, you know, letting the Lord lead me where he has me to go to share the gospel. But um, I was kind of starting to feel sorry for myself. And it gets it gets to me when I, you know, go to my hotel and it's just, um, it's been two years of, uh, in a way, a lonely journey. And and I just reached out to God and I would just start praying and worshiping and um realize we are so blessed to have Jesus like you're really never alone a lot of us might feel lonely even we might be in our families but might feel lonely um, but you can always reach out to Jesus and he's always there and just such an intimacy and such beauty and it's just so overwhelming you, I, you can't I can't wait to see how heaven is like when just getting a taste of Jesus now and uh, his reality and just amazing intimacy. And that's what we've been made for. You know, um, no, no matter um, how much money we have and what we think makes us happy, we can't, we can't be fulfilled until we're in that relationship with God. It's what we were, we were made for that. That's where we get our um, fulfillment. That's where we get our um, peace, no matter what we're going through. I wish I was here saying this is what had happened and this is how God has delivered Said. I'm still in the midst of my trial. I, you know, Said's in, in, in an Iranian prison because of his Christian faith. He's been tortured. He's been told he'd be free if he re renounces Christ. Um, they gave him eight years. He's two years into the eight year sentence, but um, because he's been sharing Christ in prison, um, they've said they would add on years, and recently, you know, uh, Saeed's mom was told from, you know, the Supreme Leader's office that Saeed should have been killed and that he could, he would never see the light of day and uh, because he hasn't, unless he, you know, unless he becomes Muslim and reads the Quran and gives a test or something. And so I don't know when this whole, you know, where when this will be over and how, but but I can um, say I have hope and trust in God that he's in control and no matter what the outcome, um, I know I'll be okay. I, I know, I just, I don't, you know, I've always struggled with fear all my life. I've always struggled with fear and anxiety of the future. What What's the next bad news? And nothing ever bad really happened, but I was always afraid. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden when Saeed was taken, and I'll gi give you a little detail about our story, but when he was taken, it was unexpected. He was in Iran working on an orphanage that the government had ac actually encouraged us to work on. He was working with the Iranian government. So when he was taken, I felt my whole world turned upside down. I became a single mom. I didn't know what my future would was, look like as a single mom, how we were gonna make it. Um, and I didn't, I didn't even know if my husband was alive. The first week, um, you know, um, I was in Boise. I got a call from Iran, um, his mom, you know. So Saeed left. So in June of 2012, I dropped Saeed off at the airport, Boise airport. He did his normal nightly routine with the kids the night before, and which is, you know, running, you know, uh, running around the house, uh, doing a prayer walking and worship and and praying with the kids and getting them all riled up before bed and which always upset me and uh, and so and you know doing reading the Bible and praying with them and all of that and then so he did that and 
he would, uh, a lot of times he would open up his suitcase and he would say, you know, he would tell the kids, um, bring your toys and your clothes that you want me to give to the orphans. And so they would come and uh, they'd bring their like raggedy old dolls or clothes. And he'd say, nope, give me your favorite, your favorite outfit, your favorite toy. And I was like, no, because <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm the only mom. I, you get attached to your kid's stuff. Sometimes you're like, that costs this much money. And we, you know, we were always struggling financially. And so I was just like, no, you know, don't do this to our kids. You're so mean. And, <laughs> and but he would lovingly sit down and explain, like, God wants us to give our best. Not just, he doesn't want our leftovers. He wants us to trust him and give our best. And, and so he would do that, you know, and he would always say, you know, I'll come home and I'll bring you. He would bring him, like, uh, outfits from the local village or something. And, and so, he, you know, we did the normal routine. And he said, I'll come back and I'll bring you gifts and all that. And then um, uh, five, I think his flight was leaving at 7. So I remember getting up really early. It was 5 or something. And he kissed our kids good, uh, goodbye never realizing that that would be the last time he'd be able to, to hold our kids. Um, and then I dropped him off at the airport and not realizing that that was going to be the last time I would see my husband. Um, I don't know. I, I think about that time. What would I do differently? Maybe I would not let him go. <laughs> That's why the Lord didn't show me. I don't know. I would have stopped. I would have done everything to keep him. So I, you know, I said a quick goodbye, not, you know, I, I think about it, it wasn't even an emotional one, it was just like dropping him off at the curb, and like, I'll pick you up in a few weeks, and he was supposed to go finish up some work at the orphanage and just come home, and, and um, he calls me in July, and we're talking to him while he's in Iran, and he calls me in July, and he says, they're not letting me leave the country, um, they, uh, you know, they took my passport. They're not letting me leave the country. So we're confused. Why is this happening? So he call, keeps calling the uh, passport control uh, office. And then finally, he through passport control, they give him some number from intelligence police that works there. And he, he's talking to the intelligence police. And they're telling him, well, we have some questions for you. And we're going to ask you some questions and, and let you go. And so we're waiting for some call from the office intelligence office or something to ask some questions and I'm I'm here in Boise um, in the US I get a call midnight um, from Saeed's mom he was staying with his parents in Iran and she's crying frantically she says they took my son they took my son I don't know where they've taken him so these five revolutionary guards which are considered terrorist group by a lot of nations came and just took him in the most horrific way and um, and his his mom was hysterical, and I, I'm sure as any mom, just seeing your baby being taken away in such a horrific way, and not knowing where, what, just what just happened, and and um, I remember just hit me like this can't be my life, this can't be happening, and um, and so I, uh, I I was just walking around the house crying and looking at my kids and thinking, what am I going to tell them? And um, and I remember my mom just crying, kneeling down and crying and saying, how can I help you? And she's she's you know moms are great friends they're they're rocks, and I remembered thinking this is one one thing that she can't help me. I'm in such a place of anxiety and despair that this is she can't help me and I remember like trying to call Saeed so many times we all you know he was when I went to Iran in 2001 I met Saeed in 2002 and um, he was just my best friend he was I never dated before and I just processed everything with him so I kept calling his number I think it took me like a week to be like stop calling him he's not going to answer and I realized, wow, it's um, this is how it is when so, you lose a loved one. You want to hear their voice one more time. Just that comfort you get from hearing their voice, and you realize I can't, it's, I can't hear it. And and so I couldn't get comfort, or any, no one could help me. And I realized no human being in the world can help me except God, who made me. And so I, I reached out to God in desperation. I I, I remember um, just 
crying out saying, God, I, I, I feel myself going to this dark hole. I need help. Uh, no one can help me. I need help. Like the woman bleeding for 12 years, reaching out and saying, you know, just believing. And just I feel, I felt the Lord just give me this peace has washed over me washed over me that just was supernatural beyond my understanding and the Lord's just I could um, you know for the first time I want to share from John 15 for the first time I felt like I was in the vine for almost 30 years of my Christian walk but I wasn't abiding for the first time I felt like I was abiding and I was just taking in his goodness and just taking in my whole world had fallen apart but I was okay and I knew for the first time in my life that I could lose everything and everyone and I knew I would be okay. I always feared that. I always thought if I lose this person, if this happens, I will lose it. I will become a basket case. And this is the first time I just had discovered Jesus in such an intimate way that I just knew if I lost sight, if I lost my kids, and you know, I, before I was even afraid to say it. What if I say it and I lose them, you know? Just if I lost everything and everyone, and I was in a corner, I didn't have anything, but I have Jesus, I'll be okay, I'll be more than okay. I'll, I'll have peace and I'll have joy. And I don't know, that was so freeing for me to discover Jesus in such an intimate way and to know that um, I can go through the storms of life and just be okay and be more than conqueror in Christ, just be have so much peace and joy. And as Christians, we don't take this for granted, but. Um, religion you go through trial through religion and you fall apart because it doesn't give you it there's no relationship but as Christians we go through the worst trials and if we cling on to God if we abide in him we actually are refreshed more and more the more the trial the more the pain the more the drama the more the more you connect like a leech you know you just connect and the more you receive what is, what is, you know, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. It's love, peace, joy, kindness, gentleness. You get all of that. You just, you cling to him and you're more refreshed. You're, you have more joy and peace than, I guess, in the times where I was, I didn't have trials, but I was in despair and I was anxious and I was sad and, you know, and I discovered that. I, I knew, I knew that no matter the trial, I would just, I knew now how to, how to um, dig deeper into God. I knew I'd found my source, and I knew I, I, it would just be better in terms of my intimacy, and I was, I'm tasting, tasting um, more of heaven, I guess, looking forward to heaven, because if this is the intimacy with Christ, I experience, I experience daily because of this painful journey um, then if, if that's what heaven is, then I'm all, I, I'm excited. For the first time, you know, I've been excited to really experience heaven. And um, so for the 30 years, almost 30 years of my Christian walk, I was in Christ, but I hadn't abided. And so I, I, I um, and so when, um, when this happened and I was, you know, um, trying to call Saeed, he's not answering, of course. I'm seeing my kids, recently my kids did a video, I don't know if some of you might have watched it, to President Obama, and at, my son's just talking about his heart crying, and my daughter just is crying and saying, I keep praying and praying and daddy's not home. And, um, and it's painful, as a mom, sometimes it's easier to have your own suffering then when you see a loved one suffer and there's nothing you can do, maybe a broken marriage or your, your grandkids or your nieces and nephews or your kids, your own kids, when you see someone you love suffering, you just, it's harder sometimes. And so it's been, for me, it's been harder seeing my kids really miss their dad and, and they've they flipped through their album. And the first few weeks, um, the first week I, I wouldn't tell them, I was afraid the shock of prison they would be shocked. So um, finally, my son came crying, and he said, "He's, you know, he's six now. He was four, and and he said, does Daddy not love us anymore? He doesn't. He he doesn't want to hear our voice anymore, and he's crying and crying. And I just saw they felt Daddy had abandoned them. He didn't love them anymore. And I and I and I was just 
in tears and I said, no, daddy loves you so much. He wants, to, I'm sure he longs to hear your voice and hug you and hold you, but this is, he's in prison. And I had to sit down and explain to him. I said, he can't call you. It's not that he doesn't want to hear your voice. Um, and um, it was really painful explaining that to them. And, you know, my daughter was daddy's girl, his daddy's girl. And um, recently she celebrated her eighth birthday and this third birthday without him. Last time she was with her dad, was she was five. And, um, and you know, Saeed had, has written a letter from prison to her. It's amazing that tells her, you know, um, I want to hear you sing hallelujah. And uh, I'm here because of, you know, uh, the answer to the why I'm not freed is the, is the answer to it is who. Because Jesus Christ, he's worth the price. And, you know, I want to hear you sing hallelujah in the midst of your storm. And I hope to join you in person, but even in prison, apart or together, you know, I want to sing a, a, for us to sing hallelujahs together. And he's just such a great, you know, such a, and Rebecca is just, they're taking in everything they receive from him. But they flip through their album so many times, it's falling apart. And they tell me, you know, tell us stories about daddy and Rebecca just for the first few weeks, she's just bawling. She's just like, Mommy, I'm forgetting Daddy's voice. I don't know his, how his voice sounds like anymore. And so we play videos of him, and they see pictures of him. They wouldn't, couldn't remember. Um, and it was painful for me to watch. So I'm just holding back tears and just, you know, letting. I realize that they're getting ministered to when they're watching their dad on video. And and I, I remember Saeed's parents, uh, when they first visited him in prison, they told me, you know, he was put in solitary when he was taken. He was put in solitary confinement. And um, for the first week, we didn't know where he was or if he was even alive because someone uh, around the time Saeed was arrested, someone else was arrested like that, a blogger, and was raided. His parents' house was raided too. He was taken. And he lasted four days before he was tortured to death in Evan prison, the same prison Saeed was in. But we didn't even know if Saeed was in Evan prison, but we didn't know if he was alive the way he was taken. Uh, we didn't know where they'd taken him. And um, uh, after a week, I called his parents' house where I knew it was being, uh, his, their phones were being you know, monitored by the government. And I said, if I don't know where Saeed is, I will go to media. I, I need to know where my husband is. And as soon as I called his parents and they were hearing, a couple hours later, Saeed called his parents and said, I'm in Evan prison. I'm in solitary. I'm OK. It was months later after they visited him that they realized, I mean, you hear solitary, and then you hear this. The first time his parents saw him, his mom, it, it was behind a glass window and where you talk on the phone. And, um, and she, as she was approaching the glass window to see him, she just fell. She couldn't recognize him because of all the beatings. And she just, she couldn't even go. She couldn't, she just was crying and just, and realized the, what he'd gone through. I mean, um, months of isolation, and you're in, you're in this room by yourself. You can't even stretch out completely, and um, you know you're not you're not really taken into consideration. You're not really taken to the restroom, uh, maybe once a day. So you're pretty much sleeping in the same place. You're it's it's horrible. It's 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 a horrible situation, and no no one to talk to. Just that intense being in solitary is, is torture itself and then being taken out of solitary and interrogated and beaten and told you know if you return to Islam you're, you you get to go home f and be with your kids right now but if you know and and but for Saeed to say no I believe in Jesus he's you know he's my Lord and Savior and not only that you know realize um we realized as the weeks went by and the months went by he was leading people to Christ. You know, I got a letter from one of the prisoners who said, I'm not in prison anymore. I feel free. I've been, I feel like I've been set free. And because of your husband and his wife actually got a hold of me and we prayed together and she gave her life to Christ. She said, my husband's changed. When I visit him, he has so much peace and joy. So because of Saeed's testimony, not only did he not deny Christ, he was sharing Christ. And um, he, because of him sharing Christ, they moved him to an exile prison. So they exiled him. And I didn't even know you could do that. But they exiled him to a, a prison that was about an hour and a half away from Tehran. And 
they put him in the murder ward, and they, uh, the head of the, that prison, the exile prison, told Saeed that he said, there's no way he can lead people to Christ here, because if, even if these, murder, these people that are on death row for murder and rape, if they realize Saeed is a Christian, they will kill him. If they realize he's a convert, they will kill him. And, um, and so, by God's grace, you know, some of these prisoners were having dreams and we're coming and asking Said, who's this Jesus? We want to know about this Jesus. We hear you can tell us about him. And so the murder war didn't really work very well as a, for him. So, and th th that was a horror. I mean, he was losing weight. He had lice all over him. He was, he still has internal injuries that have never been, the government, I think part of their torture is to beat you really bad and then just let you suffer the rest of your prison t sentence. They don't really try to treat it. So he's still in a lot of pain. Actually, uh, a few weeks ago when his mom visited him in prison, he couldn't even sit through the 20-minute visitation. He had to leave half, 10 minutes into it because of pain. And so, um, so they moved him from that horrible murder war to... Um, political ward, and he was leading people to Christ there, but his physical health was not very well, so they, they moved him to a hospital. Well, in a hospital, you have a lot of people coming in with accidents. I mean, he had like five guards around him and well, people watching him, but it was a private hospital. People are coming for accidents and, and all of that, and so uh, people are getting saved because their Saeed is praying for them, saying, you know, I'm a Christian. Can I pray in Jesus' name for you? And this girl was about to lose her. Her dad was um, a very high up judge and her mom was a very well known lawyer and these are people that persecute Christians and her, their, their daughter was losing her leg in a, in a very bad, bad auto, uh, automobile accident and Said had gone you know his parents were sharing with me they, they got to be at the hospital with him and they, Said had said can I pray in Jesus name and they were in such a desperate point they were strong Muslims say yes Eventually, it just the doctors kept kept to amputate her leg, and they could. They were like, "There's life, there's life," you know. Finally, there was like one little toe they had to cut off, and and the parents were. I mean, Said was in their room worshiping, praying, um, and other um, other um, patients were coming and saying, "Can this pastor pray for us?" I mean, nurses were giving their hearts to Christ, and doctors and. And so, and, and I mean, the head of the guard, prison guards would come and ma see how Said was doing. He's seeing like these um, guards who are supposed to be watching Said reading Bibles. Because, <laughs> I mean, they're taking turns on their watch for Said. They're taking turns reading Bible. And it's just, they finally had enough and they beat him and took him back to the prison May of this year. Um, he hadn't fully recovered and with the beating, he was even doing worse. But. You know, they've kept, they've moved him around so many times, but Said has not only uh, not denied Christ, he's been a light, you know, a light for Christ in those horrible prisons for people who have no, who had no other way. He would pray for the Lord to send him to places that no one could go and having no idea that it, w it would be a dark, dark prison in Iran. And, um, and so he's been a testimony. And so, you know, I've heard a lot of, um, bad news over the last two years, but, you know, uh, it hasn't been able to crumble me. I mean, I've had moments of just, why is he doing so bad? I remember his mom saying, he's already sick. Why does he have to have lice all over him? And those are just, you know, that's just an additional thing to worry about. And when she saw him, she's just, he was covered with lies and not doing very well. And, and there's been moments where I'm just like, or when they moved him to the exile prison, I was just shocked. Um, I remember, um, you know, as the prisoners were telling stories later to their family, um, as they were taking Saeed to the exile prison, there was prisoners that would kneel down and saying, I want to accept Jesus now. And there was other prisoners who had accepted Christ and they were crying and telling Saeed, I'm, we're going to carry your torch. We're going to share Christ now. And there were baby Christians. And, and so just so many amazing testimonies and um and so i've heard a lot of news where i'm like why lord it was like evan prison's bad enough why did he have to be moved to that prison why does he have to have be suffering and but um you know the lord has no matter the bad news i've crumbled i've, I've had moments of despair but he's his grace has been sufficient for me and every day he's given me the strength to get up most days i think i'm not going to be able to get up 
Okay, I, I'm, it's, I don't know how to explain it, but I feel um, I, the, the battle is every day. It's not like two years ago I was, had peace and now it's, it's an everyday struggle where I get up, I'm in a lot of pain, I have a thorn on my side like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12. And I'm like, Lord, remove it. And God's like, my grace is sufficient. He gives me the strength, the peace, the joy to continue. And, you know, it's not something you can fake. You can't go through the worst time of your life where your kids are hurting, your husband's in prison, you haven't seen him, talk to him, and, um, and to be okay. It's, you can't make yourself okay. It has, and you can't, and, and, and even if, you know, my, in my flesh, I like, uh, in my nature, I like being in a room, closed room, and not uh, when I'm suffering, I guess, not really do much, but to be able to not only be okay, but to stand up, have the strength to uh, talk and travel. You know, uh, before Saeed was taken, I feared so many things. I was afraid of airplanes, deathly afraid of airplanes. Saeed would beg me to travel with him. I'd be like, no, I don't want to get on an airplane. I was afraid of uh, leaving my kids. I don't know if some... Maybe I was the only like clingy mom, but I was like, no, I can't. The, the thought of leaving my kids for like a few days gave me anxiety, and so um, and just uh, afraid of speaking in front of people. Um, never, you you can't find any videos or anything of me speaking in front of anyone before 2012, and. Um, um, deathly afraid of speaking in front of people. Very private person. I remember Saeed sharing stuff on the, uh, he would take a picture and share it on Facebook. We're eating dinner here, where we're doing this. I'd be like, no, why do people need to know what we're doing? So very private person. I just thought, you know, people don't need to know what my life is. And, and very home, I'm, I'm, me and my son, Jacob, are homebodies. Just, I recently took him to Washington, D.C., and Rebecca was like, oh, that was fun. Let's go on another trip. Jacob's like, mom, I just want to stay in Boise. And so we're both, we could just stay in Boise for the rest of our life, we'll be okay. And um, not a big traveler, not really excited to see the world. And uh, people are like, you, we've gone to France and Geneva and this and that. I've gone before the European Parliament, the Dutch, Dutch Parliament, all these places, Europe. And um, for me, it's just, it's, it's it, you know, it's not like exciting, I guess. It's just, it looks, everywhere looks the same for me. I'm not really a traveler. You know, I'm not excited to see new exotic places, I, let's just say that. Um, so for me to have, the, at the worst time of my life, to be doing things I would normally never do in my strongest time is a miracle. Um, and um, I felt for the first time when Saeed was taken, um, I felt the, for the first time I, I abided in the vine. And John 15 really came to life for me, and I, that's what I want to share with you. Um, and I realized it's talking about being in the vine. It's talking to Christians. You know, it says, I am the vine. My father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me, and it continues to say. So it's talking about branches in him. It's talking about believers. But I realized there's a difference between being in the vine and abiding. And for the first time, I feel like after almost 30 years of being a Christian, I was finally able to abide. And part of... Um, Part of the abiding, you know, some of this might be a, you know, um, very hard concept. What does that mean? What does, what does it mean to live, you know, victorious Christian life and abide and have God bear fruit? What does all of that mean? I felt the Lord, and this is what I want to share. I feel like, uh, you know, a clam who just has this thing, this uh, dirt that it's trying to get rid of, that pain or whatever it is that's bothering it, it becomes into a pearl. And I feel like this is the pearl of, of my suffering the last couple of years that I want to share with the body of Christ. Um, and so the first part of the abiding that the Lord showed me was when all of this happened and I was in deep despair and I had no control over anything of my finances, my future, my kids, my husband, everything was out of control. I felt the Lord showing me that a lot of my anxiety came because I wanted control. Of, I wanted to control my husband. I wanted to control my kids. I wanted to fix this. And, 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 um, and, and the Lord showed me that I had a flesh that I had been my, myself, that I had trusted for so long as a Christian. For the first time in my 30 years of knowing Christ, I realized, I, I felt the Lord saying, you've 
you've gone with your, your, you are in a fallen nature. You know, for so many years, every emotion that came, uh, uh, came, you know, I had, uh, this person should be treating me like this, and my husband needs to be that way, and my kids need to be this way, and this, all of that I trusted, and the Lord just opened up my eyes, your heart, the Bible says, it's, it's not me saying it, I didn't like hearing this either, your heart is evil, your heart that you're relying on, that's the world's telling you, do what you feel like, do, you know, um, may, do what it takes to make yourself happy and go with your instinct. The Bible says it's evil and it will lead you. It's a big path. It's a, it's a wide path and it will lead you to destruction if you follow it. And so the Bible says your heart is evil. Your thoughts are to be kept captive. And the only way for the Spirit of God to work is if you get rid of yourself. You die to yourself. You wake up with your flesh and you just, and as women we have, you know, there's certain times we're very emotional, and, you know, it's hard to uh, have control over that. But it's, you have to first realize you're in, you're in a fallen nature and it's deceiving you. If you go with it, it will bring destruction to your marriages, it will bring destruction to your uh, church, to your community, and it's destructive. And there's a path um, that's narrow. There's life in it. And that path requires the cross. You know how the same, the Lord just, uh, one, one day I was praying, the Lord showed me this cross where the body of Christ going, or the people going to the cross and getting saved. And you know for Muslims, it's weird that we wear the cross. It's a sign of death. How could, how could you wear something that's so horrible? But for us, is the wisdom of God. For us, it's the power of God. For us, it's life. But we forget that that same cross that we go to to get saved is the same cross we're supposed to carry. We're supposed to carry our cross. So we leave our, the cross behind. And we are not living victorious Christian lives. We're having the same divorce rate as the rest of the world. We're having the same problems that the, as the rest of the world. Because we've become Christians, but we are not living. We're, we're letting our flesh get in the way like the rest of the world. And the only difference, the only way we can be different is when we can get rid of ourselves. And we have the power to do that. No religion does. Jesus Christ gives you the power to forgive your enemy. Other religions say destroy your enemy. But Jesus Christ tells us and, and uh, gives us the power to forgive our enemy. And I'm saying your enemy might be your spouse right now. <laughs> Can you forgive? Can you love unconditionally? Can you lay down your life when that person is not being loving? It could be your coworker, it could be your boss, it could be someone you're working with. Can you lay down your life when it's painful? A lot of times, you know, and I've had a lot of my own issues the last two years and attacks and people doing things and saying things. It's, I'm not free from the fallen world either and fallen people. And so there's a lot of times I want to say things, and I feel like if I don't say, this person needs to know, and this person needs to behave better, and, you know, and I feel like if I don't say it, I will have a heart attack. And I realize there's a part where Paul says, I die daily so you may live. And I realize I need, the, the, we have a choice. Either we can die to ourselves, which is very painful. You have to hold back a lot of things you want to say and lay down your life when you don't, when you want to, punch someone, you do, want, you do something, you know, you, you, you say you're, I don't know, whatever it is, you take, you know, you lay down your life and, um, and then, you know, um, I want to come, come, come back to John 15 where it says, you know, when we abide in, um, and when we abide in God, um, it says, and you say, how do I abide in God? And it's all, all related. And Jesus says, abide in my love. And, and then you say, how do I, Jesus, how do I abide in your love? Verse 9 says, abide in my love. Verse 10 of John 15 says, if you keep my commandments. And guess, I mean, you might be like, what commandment should I keep? There's so much. Actually, the Bible is so simple. Love one another. You know, and so when, when we can get rid of our selfish self, and a lot of times for me, when my flesh wants to just argue and, and protect and say, why did you say that? And how d I just hold back. And it's, I, f I do feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. If I can, I'll take a bath, have coffee, calm down, go in a room, um, um, 
and I was at as Pastor um, Greg Laurie's church. I was speaking at a women's conference, and I didn't realize there was a uh, people were watching online. And so I was talking about the coffee and bath, how it calms me down. And I was going to the next day. I was going to Pastor Greg Laurie's office, and one of his pastors said, "Did you take your bath? Did you have your coffee?" And I was like, "How does he know?" I didn't. I was talking to a group of women. <laughs> I didn't realize there's like, you know, people were watching. So. Um, but, you know, so, but I'll lock myself in a room and I'll argue and be like, no, this person, they need to know, how dare they, they're, you know, they're supposed to be, especially the Christians, we, they're Christian, they should know better, how dare they, why, you know, and the Lord, what gives me finally peace is me arguing in my room so people don't think I'm crazy, is the Lord finally saying, you have no right, you have no right, you don't need to tell, show that person you were right or this and that, you don't need to change. You have no right. Die to yourself and go love that person. And every single time that's God's message to me. Die to yourself. Go love that person. And it's, I have to just do it. Step of obedience. And so Jesus is saying that. How do you abide in him? You have, you um, abide in his love. How do you abide in his love? You obey his commandment. How do you obey? What commandment? He says in verse uh, 13, greater love has no one than to lay one's life down for his friends, and verse 12 before that says, this is my command, that you love one another. I remember hearing that Apostle John towards the end of his life would say, love one another. And I would think, oh, he's old, he was old, and he just like, that's a simple message. Come on, give us some meat, you know? You know, and Apostle John, that's all he said, and it's easy, but it's hard. It requires death to self, and Jesus says we're not worthy to be his disciple if we don't die to ourselves. So I want to give you what I've seen the Lord do in my life. So when I've been able to abide in him and let go of how I think things should work out and when, the timing and everything, and just trust God and every, everywhere he's taken me, you know, with no money, with no plan to, you know, Saida and I had prayed for years for the gospel to be preached. We didn't have a plan, um, and we didn't have any money. And f to have nothing and be at your lowest time in your life and to be taken before nations. You know, I've spoken in front of the United Nation. I, I was able to, I was sitting in front of over 100 nations. And at the United Nations, is like circle, half circle, and at the front is like the president or whoever. And, and there's above, above that, and it's in Geneva, and above that is translators, all in these glass windows where they're, you know, translating. And so here I was in front of over 100 nations, and I'm telling all these nations, not 100 people, this is 100 ambassadors and government officials, nations, I'm telling them that Jesus Christ is a solution to what you're trying to figure out. Two weeks, three weeks of getting together and trying to solve the world's problems and world peace, and and. I was able to say that to the world and say, you know, Jesus Christ is the answer. And I had free translators, you know, and and people, they were listening. You know, I, I had an ACLJ lawyer with me, and she, she said, there, you could hear a pin drop. They were listening. And, and to go before Geneva Summit for Human Rights and Democracy, very liberal human rights group in Geneva, and to be the only Christian speaker and say, you know, talk about Jesus Christ. Um, Saeed's in prison because he believes Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin and to go before the European Parliament the Dutch Parliament there I was uh, talking to uh, the Communist Party and the Socialist Party and they're getting emotional as I'm sharing about Jesus and I'm thinking this can't be happening <laughs> they're not supposed to get emotional over this they're, the, they're part of you know they represent the Communist Party and the Socialist Party <laughs> they were and to go um, before very secular media, you know, CNN and, and Fox and also um, uh, BBC Farsi and VOA Persian have millions of Iranians listen live as I've shared Christ. It's, it's a miracle. I, I couldn't have planned it. I, no amount of money fundraising could have allowed me to do this. But, um, and this is the beauty of the Lord choosing my life. Uh, someone from Boise, Idaho, who's deathly afraid of airplanes, deathly afraid of speaking in front of people, who um, has, um, you know, we we like to put names on ourselves. Uh, introvert, Said was extrovert, not a people person.
But the Lord can just be like, no, you know, in me you're different. In me, I'm going to use you for the gospel. And, um, and so if he can choose someone who has never taken any speaking classes, is scared of speaking, all of that, and take her before nations with no money and no connections and no plan, he can take anyone. But he's just, he wants, he's calling the body of Christ to abide. You might have been in him for 20, 30, 40 years. He's saying, will you abide in me? I have a master plan for all the problems you're seeing. You're afraid of where the nation is going. I know how to solve it. Will you abide in me? I want to shine. You know, I grew up in Iran the first few years of my life before I came to the States, and there was a war. Uh, with Iraq, and I remember uh, we had to at night turn off. We didn't. Ha we didn't. The government turned it off for us. All the they we'd have no power. We always had to have candles. So we uh, so the Iraqi planes couldn't see the lights, and they could they couldn't bomb the houses. Our houses. It was the the war was in our in, in Iran, and we could see houses bombed. And in the morning, when my brother and I would go to school, we'd see dead bodies and houses that were missile and bombed, and you could hear the. The whistle going through in a whole neighborhood kind of disappearing. And so uh, a lot of like chemical warfare and just stuff that we saw as kids. And, um, and the lights would, the government would turn off all the lights, you know, there would be no power. And then you had your candle. Guess where everyone was? The candle. You know, the Bible says we're the light of the world. It doesn't say we're a light, there's no other light. And God is saying to his body, can you carry your cross? That's where the power is. That's where the life is. Stop living selfish lives that's destroying your family, your church, your community. I have a plan. You don't need to bear the fruit. I know how to take you before government officials and nations. I know how to, how to change this nation. I know how to bring revival. I'm just looking for someone who can get rid of themselves and say, Lord, you work no matter how painful, no matter what your plan is. And, and I feel this is the message um, from God to his church. And he can, I do feel, uh, as I pray for this nation, you know, it's a, it's a nation that gave me Jesus. I always say I was a Muslim and I was able to find Jesus here. I had the freedom to choose Jesus here. And so I pray for America a lot. And I feel like God is waking up the church because there will be a turnaround. There will be, we will see a turnaround in this nation. And he's calling you to abide in him. You've been in him for so long, but he wants you to taste him. He wants you to know him intimately, know him and shine for him. Then evangelism is not hard. You know, the early church, it says, um, people could see, uh, um, the, the, uh, the uh, people, I think I went over, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I just realized that. The people could see the love and unity in the church, and people were added to the church daily. Evangelism was not hard. People were at it. They saw it. They came to the light. You know, uh, I've had to, I, I, when I was in Geneva, for example, in United, in, you know, for the United Nations, there was a lot of Iranian human rights advocate that would come to me, and they would say, can you tell us about Jesus? We are, we are not Muslim anymore. We're, we think we're agnostic. We've heard so much amazing testimony coming out of that prison from your husband. Um, the prisoners who are released are telling us stories about your husband. We want to know about this Jesus. So the world wants it. Once they see the reality of Jesus, once we're rid of the religion, of the preaching, we're living it in our families, and our communities. And he's, God is, Jesus is so beautiful. People want him. But they have to see him. They, ha they see us as Christians, and they see our flesh, and they're like, no. But we have to get rid of ourselves so they can see Jesus. And once they see him, there's, they're going to fall in love. They will come to him. And so I, before I um, finish, I want to always give you a chance. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I, uh, I invite you to invite him to your heart as your Lord and Savior and accept his, what he did on the cross for your sin. You can be in your worst, and this life is hard. Whether you're single or married or what, you will go through trials of life. It's, it will not, it doesn't have favorites. Life is hard. But I can tell you, 
you when you connect to your maker you will you can be okay in the worst time of your life you can be at peace you can be strong you're very weak people say you're strong i say i know how weak i am i know most mornings i can't even get up but i've discovered the strength of god so i invite you to come to know him and if you do know him i invite you to abide in him god is calling you to abide he wants a deeper deeper relationship with with the body of christ and so i invite you to do that thank you for having me thank you for your prayers i can do it without you god bless you